So first I'll cut right to the chase and talk about the question, why does McKinsey work use the term hacker to describe such a large number of people? Um, because as we discussed last time, almost everybody's a hacker um, according to work in this in this economy, which runs on high level information and asymmetry of information. Um, she points out that the term hacker is now a pejorative term, you know, and hackers are associated in people's minds with a sort of subculture, a criminal type of element. And um, this term is therefore perfectly fitting um, from work's perspective because it reminds that this class, like other people, can or should maybe take back their identity, so to speak, by claiming the name for themselves. So work uh, very consciously addresses this. Um, hackers are characterized by the, the ability to make the old appear new, as she, as she says, and this can happen in so many different ways. But basically, as we'll see, the problem for the um, vectorless class is that it's very, it seems very difficult to pin down information and to monetize it, but many of us work to help the vectorless class do that. Um, now, we'll get back to that in more detail in a bit, but another big question that arises in this book is, is this capitalism? And Wark wants to argue that no, it's not. Now, one thing that stood out to me, um, just going through these first two chapters, is that the typical argument for why this might not be capitalism is absent. It's not there. What has occurred to me over the years is that we aren't in the type of capitalism that many people kind of fantasize about where small business people can and do, you know, thrive and uh, compete with each other and and all of this. We're in a, you know, I've thought we're may, maybe in a different type of capitalism, corporate capitalism or even corporatist capitalism. Um, but, you know, I've asked the question, is the market free? And in doing so, I've thought a lot about um, the role of government and how our, in the U US, our government has aided and abetted the development of these major corporations and the corporatization of farming, for instance, um, and, and really wiped out small proprietors. Um, and so for me, this has been the main go-to answer to the question, is this capitalism? And I'll say, well, not quite, or it's not the capitalism that you um, imagined it to be. So Mackenzie Wark um, more or less takes that position and, and criticizes it as not, it's not good enough. It doesn't go far enough. Um, she's quite tired of people coming up with different versions of capitalism. Um, so, but then you know, what is it that we have, all right? Um, Work says most, most of us are trained to think that there's these two big options, capitalism or communism. Um, but that way of thinking, again, is old. It's, it's caught in um, these old categories. It doesn't have quite enough imagination. And so she wants to encourage us not to come up with yet another version of capitalism because she says that's almost like it's, it's almost like idolatry of capitalism. And it's done even by Marxists who just can't let go of, <clears throat> of the idea of capital and capitalism as an economic um, system to, in their case, to push against. Um, Work consciously um, addresses her methodology and basically says, and this is in chapter one, that she is going to use, she's going to engage in this strategy of detournment or um, hijacking or rerouting ideas. Um, work is not really interested at all in staying true to Marx or any other thinker. Um, but she does recognize that, or at least she argues that you can't just start from total scratch, that inevitably when we think we have to incorporate ideas from the past. So the, the trick is to not be trapped in them and not to become what um, Friedrich Nietzsche would call genealogists of sorts, you know, digging back into the past for the sole purpose of getting it right and, uh, and nostalgically going back. Um, 
So, you know, she says there's not much choice but to work with received ideas, but there's more than one way to select from tradition. And, she, and her way is, is fairly disrespectful in some senses. On the one hand, she pays uh, Marx a lot of due for practicing determinal in, in his own time. Um, but at the same time, uh, what she wants to do is the same with his thought now. Um, and so she is going to she does incorporate a lot of Marx's thought, um, but then she twists it and uses it in different ways. And it certainly is not at all orthodox and does not um, attempt to be. Um, and so step one for this argument is to start not by writing this grand narrative of history like Marx attempted to do, at least in the, in the Communist Manifesto, but also in other writings. Um, uh, instead, she's going to start from the present. And, and I think that work assumes that the present is different enough from what has come before that it really has to be examined carefully, especially all of the technology that we've developed so rapidly. Okay, more on that as well. But a question started to emerge in my mind as I read these first two chapters. I'm a political scientist, political theorist, and so um, I asked, you know, like at the end of it all, where was government? And I realized that work had hardly mentioned government. Um, now remember that work's background is in media theory and critical theory. Um, critical theory can and, can and does touch on government, but I think that that media theory and the the um, the tendency in Wark's education and development to to pay close attention to culture um, makes it more likely that we will not be getting a strictly speaking political theory here, and to the point where um, there's not much mention of government, at least not of the institutions. Um, she does mention that this large hacker class is unlike the previous uh, laboring working class, much more difficult to uh, organize and to, for instance, to uni unionize or something like that, um, which is at least, you know, a nod to the idea that people can organize and maybe should organize into a force, and that is political activity. But as far as the institutions of government, no. Um, Another reason is because work is some kind of lapsed Marxist, and I, I use that term really advisedly, okay, um, I would not call work a Marxist by any means. Lapsed Marxist, maybe in the sense that, um, you know, she's, she's, she's uh, definitely explicitly saying that's too old, it's passe. He was writing about an economy of a different time that we don't have anymore but at the same time is using some of the ideas. Now, Marx, though, you know, his idea was that the political structure was epiphenomenal to the economy. And I think that work is still drawing that conclusion or that that assumption is in the back of, of, of her mind. Um, so government has all but disappeared, at least in these two chapters. Now, she talks about how during the advent of capitalism, you know, the industrial revolution and the development of the factory uh, system, the economy that produced commodities in abundance, um, that it was characterized by Marx and was, in her view, a sort of meat grinder that used people's hands and bodies and when they were no longer useful in this capacity because they'd been outstripped by a machine, they'd simply be replaced by the machine. So for Marx, capitalism was a meat grinder. But if this is something new, if we have something different, what is it grinding? Okay, what is it exploiting? And Work's answer is brains. And so there's this whole section in the chapter that deals with different movies um, and novels pointing out that our popular culture has kind of sensed that there are forces out there that are that are not, in, not allowing us our own minds. So here's a great quote. Um, 
Industrial capitalism was not terribly interested in workers who think and feel. It wanted hands, it wanted muscle. It was a flesh-eating machine. Whatever disgusting and terrifying power lurks in these more recent stories does not so much eat bodies as brains. Either your mind is erased and your body is another mind's vehicle, or your mind is subordinated to the will of another power. Either way, your mind is not your own. It feels like some vile takeover. But what if this isn't just a takeover, but a whole new class relation? All right, so, I mean, that is pretty clear. Um, so much of our work is done now um, governed by systems, systems that were made by other people who are hackers, you know, um, so that less and less of our minds of our creative ability are needed or wanted in the workplace. And so people get the feeling and the sense that they are being sort of absorbed or part of some larger machine or system that they have no control over. So there's still, she doesn't use this term, but there's still this alienation. In fact, maybe um, one could argue there's even more alienation uh, because it's difficult to locate it or to, to figure out exactly what is going on. I, I would assume it would be relatively easy for factory workers, if they're really being exploited, to figure out what's going on, and who at least the immediate explo exploiter is. But when the, when the system becomes the exploiter, when it's this amorphous and very distant um, set of entities and systems that are not, there's maybe no face that can be attached. Um, this reminds me a little bit of, uh, again, of Jacques Ellul's uh, book, The Technological Society. It becomes more dehumanizing. All right, so work spends some time on information's unique qualities. If the economy runs on the asymmetry of information and the vectorless class owns the information, how does it do that? In an economy such as ours, let's not call it capitalist, let's agree on that, um, at least for sake of argument, but in an economy where some people want to make money off of an increasingly um, technological basis um, that relies upon this information, there's got to be a way of pinning it down. So I found this paragraph in here. Well, first of all, there's this great line that plays on Marx. It says, information wants to be free, but everywhere it is in chains. Um, but this next paragraph really um, tells you how work thinks this takes place. It's very concrete. This is not mysterious at all, but it does help you to think about, about ownership of ideas and information more clearly. Vectorlists own the extensive vectors of communication which traverse space. They own the intensive vectors of computation which accelerate time. They own the copyrights, the patents, the trademarks that capture attention or sign ownership to novel techniques. They own the logistic systems that manage and monitor the disposition and movement of any resource. They own the financial instruments that stand in for the value of every resource that can be put out on markets to crowdsource the possible value of every possible future combination of those resources. They own the algorithms that rank and sort and assign particular information in particular circumstances. So if you really think about this, it comes down to the accepted legal structure that we've created works in favor of those who have the means and the, the, the wherewithal to figure out how to get legal ownership of ideas and information first. We have an awful lot of legal means of doing so. And this is how you pin down the information and make it hard for people to get um, giving them only as much as, as you need to get more, extract more information from them as consumers, as workers, and so on. All right, I will leave you with this. Towards the end of chapter two, um, Work makes mention of the society of the spectacle, which is a concept of Debord. Um, and answers the question, why is it that we have come to a point where we seem to be so inundated by 
messaging and by entertainment and what you know what does that phenomenon have to do with what she's talking about with the vectoralist class and the hacker class she says commanding attention through the ownership and control of brands celebrities and media properties is the public face the disintegrating spectacle of vectoral economy in part this descends from what was formerly the culture industry but it is no longer an industry apart, commodified leisure. It's now integrated into the whole production and consumption. Hi, Phil Swift here for Flex Tape, the super strong waterproof tape. Um, yeah, I mean, he makes tape really interesting. Now, Flex tape goes to the extreme, a really imaginative way of like capturing people's attention and getting you to endlessly watch their crazy commercials. Um, but this type of combination happens all the time where you don't know what it is exactly that you're, that you're getting there. Is it entertainment? Is it advertise, advertisement? Is it some sort of uh, motivational message? You know, what is it? Um, that integration of entertainment and spectacle into production and consumption, I think makes for a, uh, the, the feeling of restlessness as though there's never a place where you can simply be, relax, sit, enjoy because there's always a lot of things going on and there's always ulterior motives. And I wonder if this is one reason why people have become so terribly suspicious is because in our world, nothing ever is quite as it seems to be on the surface. And I think we all are learning that. And with that comes a general pessimism and suspicion that runs deeper. All right, anyway, just getting started. We'll move on to at least chapter three, if not uh, chapter four, next week.